Good thing I was able to narrow this down, because we probably could have spent a few past lives examining the anatomy of my full 2023 list, and still had a few holdovers to contend with. Hey everybody, welcome to Mainly Movies. 2023 has come and gone, and now that the Oscars video insanity is over and I've had a few months to finish catching up on most of the year's noteworthy releases, it's time to talk about my top 10 films of 2023. If you're new here, please consider subscribing for a variety of movie-related content, like reviews, rank lists, and trailer reactions. We had a nice mix of smaller independent movies and big blockbusters and franchise films this year, so there was definitely some something for everybody, and plenty of things for me. In fact, this was a very challenging list to narrow down and then place in order. I had several four and a half paw films this year, which doesn't always happen for me. And with nearly 30 of the 200 plus films I watched earning four paws or higher, there are a lot of great movies that just missed the cut for this list and could easily be on here if I had just done my ranking on a different day or if I was in a different mood. Feel free to take a look at my 2023 rankography list over on Letterboxd to see all of the films, but please keep in mind that most of the movies in the middle of that list are not very precisely ranked, so there's a lot of fluidity in there. Okay, so the usual disclaimers. I did not see every single movie that came out in 2023. I certainly tried, but I've only seen a hair over 200 feature-length 2023 releases at the time of filming this video, so this list is obviously going to exclude any movie that I haven't had a chance to see yet. You guys also know that I'm a stickler when it comes to official release year, so this list will only consist of movies with 2023 release dates. So that means there are a few movies that came out last year that I really liked that didn't make the list because they're technically 2022 movies, and there are also a few on here that aren't going to get a wide release until 2024 that made the list because they're officially 2023 movies. The other thing to keep in mind is that these are my personal top movies of the year. There are a lot of qualities that could make a movie the best, but the movies on this list are included and ranked according to how much I enjoyed them. Remember, these are just my top movies, not THE top movies, so be sure to post your own personal top 10 movies of 2023 in the comments below. I've already reviewed most of these movies on this channel, so if you want to check those out for some more in-depth thoughts on each of them, I'll put links in the description below and also link some of them up in the cards as we go along. All right, let's get this top list started. As usual with my end of year list, I want to kick things off with three honorable mentions that didn't quite make the top 10. The first is Rye Lane, which is a British romantic comedy directed by Rain Allen Miller in her directorial debut. If I had to describe this film as only one thing, it would be smile inducing. This was one of the movies that I saw at Sundance last year. And as anyone who's ever been to a film festival can attest to, they are very draining experiences, both physically and emotionally. You only get a few hours of sleep a night, so you're constantly exhausted, and you're also bombarded by four or five dense, serious films every day. And when you do that for two weeks straight, it starts to wear on you. So encountering a film like this is such a pleasant experience. This was easily the sweetest and most upbeat film I watched all of last year. It's more character-based than plot-based, but it works because of the chemistry and charisma of its two leads. Plus, this is one stylish film, especially for a genre that's kind of known for its flatness. This is fast-paced and colorful with a lot of youthful energy and kinetic editing that'll definitely remind you of Edgar Wright films. The second honorable mention is Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. We're going from a small independent rom-com to the seventh film in one of the biggest action franchises of all time. Told you this year I had a lot to offer. This movie isn't my favorite Mission Impossible, that honor still belongs to Fallout, but this is still a great addition to the series. As part one of a two-parter, though the title has since been rebranded to downplay that some, this film does only tell half of an overarching story, but this film still feels complete. It doesn't end on a cliffhanger, it doesn't stop abruptly, it is its own film. It just leaves some things open to be completed in the next movie. I know that not everyone will like the AI-centric parts of the story, but I think it mostly works and really feels like a bit of a throwback to tech thrillers from the 90s and 2000s. That said, story probably isn't the main reason that most people are interested in this franchise. 
Obviously, it's the action that always stuns with this franchise, and once again, it delivers here. Somehow, it manages to ratchet things up even over the last film, and we get a ton of interesting action sequences and big stunt spectacles. And as you'd expect with this franchise, the action's practical, and Tom Cruise is still doing his own insane stunts. My third honorable mention, and the film that just missed the cut, is Polite Society, which is the British action comedy directorial debut by Nita Manzor. Remember how I said earlier that it was really hard for me to decide on the final ranking here? Well, this was the movie that was the hardest for me to place. I had this one all over the place. I had it up in the top 10 for a while, I had it completely out of my honorable mentions for a while, I had it in all of the other honorable mention spots. I finally decided to put it here in the runner-up position, but even now, while I'm recording, I'm kind of second-guessing where I want it. But I already said it, so it's set in stone now. This was another movie that I saw at Sundance last year, and another burst of energy and joy. At its core, it's a tale of two sisters. However, this simple enough premise expands to become something outrageously unpredictable and immeasurably fun. Ridiculously entertaining and chaotic, the maximalist style of this movie throws everything at us, and it somehow works. It's an action film, a comedy, a coming-of-age teen and family drama, it's a martial arts movie, an espionage thriller, a heist film, it even throws in some horror and a dash of Bollywood. It sounds crazy, and it kind of is, but with a great cast to keep things in check, this is one of the most energetic and fun movies of last year. Coming in at number 10, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Although another animated film just missed the honorable mentions cut, this movie is the only animated film to make the list this year, but it's definitely a deserving one. It's true that this is a superhero sequel that has many of the franchise blockbuster hallmarks that people love to hate on these days, but despite the IP bonanza, this movie and its predecessor both managed to be incredibly original. Like Into the Spider-Verse, this film is a visual spectacle. It has that same comic book page come to life quality, but goes even further with the concept by incorporating the other universes within this multiverse story. We see Da Vinci sketchbook characters in a watercolor world, punk zine cutout characters in a slick futuristic world. Each universe and its inhabitants embody a unique and distinct animation style, and so the seamless blending and mixing of these as characters travel across the Spider-Verse is amazing. On the story side of things, this is a continuation and expansion of its predecessor. It has a lot going on and could be overwhelming for some, and I definitely think the ending could have been handled a bit more smoothly, but this is still a really strong and thematically dense film that manages to balance plot and character remarkably well. Coming in at number 9, Birth Rebirth. I realize it's starting to be a bit of a trend here, but this was another Sundance movie. However, this one is much less cheerful than the others I've talked about already so far. In spite of that, this was actually my second favorite of last year's festival. So this is a movie that I think could surprise a lot of people. At first glance, reading the premise or watching the trailer, this is a story that seems very familiar. It's practically impossible not to think of Frankenstein and Pet Cemetery, and those influences are definitely there. But there's more to this film. It was advertised and presented as a horror movie, which seems reasonable given the modern-day mad scientist type story, but it's really not one. There are certainly horrific moments, and it's frequently gory, but this is much more of a medical drama and thriller than it is a horror film. There's a clinical, methodical, experiment-centric approach to everything, but this movie still has a lot of heart and emotion, and even a bit of levity, thanks to the impressive performances and chemistry of its two leads. Coming in at number 8, Oppenheimer. So I suspect this might be the most unsurprising film to make the list, and probably one that the vast majority of people on the planet have in their top 10 as well. I mean, this did win seven Oscars, including Best Picture, and was half of the Barbenheimer phenomenon last summer. Christopher Nolan is a director who's become synonymous with the summer blockbuster. He started out with smaller scale films like Following and Memento, but really graduated to blockbuster hits with the Dark Knight trilogy. Even though Oppenheimer was released during the summer, made a ton of money, and has been received as though it were a blockbuster, it's really not one. This is a three hour long historical drama that's first and foremost a biopic about J. Robert Oppenheimer. 
It's a grand and epic story that weaves through Oppenheimer's life non-linearly. That could have been extremely confusing, but the strong editing and cinematography make it followable, using subtle changes to indicate the time period and perspective of a given scene. As you could probably tell from the boatload of Oscars and nominations, this film also boasted some fantastic performances. Killian Murphy was especially exceptional here as Oppenheimer, able to convey just how conflicted and haunted he was by not only his atomic creation, but also events in his personal life. Coming in at number 7, Hitman. Remember how I mentioned I was a stickler for release dates? Well, this Richard Linklater directed romantic comedy thriller is the first of two 2023 movies on this list that have not yet received a wide release. Netflix picked this one up and should be giving it a wide release this summer, but I saw this one last September at TIFF, and I liked it so much that I actually watched it again when I was at Sundance in January. This is a deceptive little movie. With a name like Hitman, it sounds pretty generic, but this unassuming seeming movie is anything but. Bolstered by a great premise, this film's fun and twisty story proves to be very entertaining. In fact, I would say this is Richard Linklater's most fun and crowd-pleasing film since School of Rock. It's got a great tonal mix, because it's very fun and smartly comedic, but it's still got some heft and seriousness to its story. There are some very noirish elements to this one, and it's able to seamlessly shift between crime thriller and romantic comedy, while also delivering the steaminess you'd expect from a 90s erotic thriller. Hitman's got a well-written screenplay and lively tone, but Glenn Powell's performance is what truly sets this film apart. He's funny and charming, but he's really able to showcase the breadth of his abilities. Definitely a leading man movie star making turn for him here. Coming in at number six, Anatomy of a Fall. A two and a half hour long trilingual French courtroom drama probably doesn't sound like the type of film that would earn the title of most tense and captivating movie I saw last year, and yet here we are. I realize that on paper, this one doesn't sound all that spectacular. I mean, a murder case where the spouse is the prime suspect is pretty standard fare for the genre. And if all this movie had was that plot, then yeah, it would be pretty standard. But there's much more to this film. It's not so much about the story, but the way in which it's presented to us. Everything is designed to make us doubt. We're presented with a web of contradictory information that makes us suspicious of every character besides the dog. Our protagonist is the prime suspect, and even though she's presented as the main character we would typically be inclined to root for, it's challenging because she's not always the most likable or sympathetic of characters. And all of this is wrapped up in a captivating and methodical legal tale. It's partly a police procedural mystery, partly a detailed legal investigation, and then partly a gripping courtroom drama that deconstructs itself into a family drama. This movie's got a fantastic script, which deservedly won an Oscar, and a phenomenal driving lead performance by Sandra Uhler that I think should have won an Oscar. Coming in at number five, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So I think this one is going to be viewed as probably my most controversial pick and placement on the list. I mean, I get it. I keep a running ranking list throughout the year, so when I started prep on this video and saw that I still had this movie so high on the list, I was a little thrown off. An MCU movie this high and above some of these other great movies? But then I took a minute to really think about it and about this movie. Apart from perhaps Across the Spider-Verse, this film fills a niche that no other movie on the list does. So what if it's not a dramatic biopic or an Oscar winner? Who cares that it's a superhero movie? Even if it was just big dumb action spectacle fun, it would belong on here if I had a good time with it. And there certainly is action spectacle fun to be had here, but this movie's also got a lot more to it than just that. It's still got the comedy and great soundtrack that we've come to expect from a Guardians of the Galaxy movie, but this installment takes things in a slightly darker and more serious direction. The characters remain a huge part of what makes this movie successful, but they're even more of a family here than they've ever been before, so we end up with a compelling and unexpectedly emotional story. Coming in at number four, Woman of the Hour. Well, we've made it to the other 2023 movie without a wide release. Like Hitman, Netflix grabbed this one up after the TIFF premiere last year, and then proceeded to just hold on to it. 
Whereas Hitman actually has a release date, Woman of the Hour is still sitting in a weird limbo, with no date, no trailer, no anything. Regardless, I thought this was a fantastic movie. In a tiff full of disappointing actor-directed films, Anna Kendrick came out swinging with a really strong directorial debut. This is a tight, tense 90-minute, 70 set period thriller based on the true story of serial killer Rodney Alcala, who in the midst of his murder spree appeared as a contestant on the dating game. The filming of this dating game episode serves as the home base for this story, with a non-linear account of Alcala's murders filling in the character background around it. Anna Kendrick plays Cheryl Bradshaw, the female contestant of that episode, and Daniel Zavato delivers a menacingly charming performance as Alcala. Woman of the Hour is equal parts chilling and compelling, tackling themes and issues that are still horrifyingly relevant nearly 50 years after the story's true events. Coming in at number 3, John Wick Chapter 4. Of the films actually in my top 10, this was the most difficult to place. This one and my number two film are basically equal to me. They're very, very different movies, which makes jerk comparison difficult, but I really do like them equally, just in different ways. So this is a circumstance where these could easily be swapped around for me, depending on the day. This fourth chapter in the John Wick franchise continues the ongoing high-concept assassin saga, somehow managing to top the also-excellent Chapter 3. This film goes bigger in just about every way, without ever jumping the shark. The action is clearly a highlight here, with plenty of gun food, car chases, and neon-soaked fights. Honestly, this features some of the best, most satisfying action I've ever seen, with sequence after sequence of exciting and memorable action. John Wick himself is as good as ever, and this film sees the introduction of some other great characters, most notably Donnie Yen's half-retired blind assassin, Kane. With excellent choreography, driving editing, and beautiful cinematography, this full-circle installment in the franchise is definitely one of the year's highlights. Coming in at number two, The Holdovers. So like I said, this and my number three pick are extremely close in my ranking. That said, at least today, this funny yet poignant film comes out on top. This is another TIFF movie to join the list, and was not only my most anticipated film of the festival last year, but also my favorite. It's bound to join the ranks of holiday watches for many people, but this is one that I know I'll be able to enjoy year-round. I love period pieces, so the early 70s setting definitely helped it get off on a good foot for me, with not only some expectedly good costumes, music, and production design, but also cinematography and editing techniques that felt very much of the time period. So not only did it seem like it was set in 1970, but it felt like a movie that could have actually been made then, too. The Holdovers has a simple, small-scale, almost slice-of-life story, but it works really well because it's a story about its three lead characters and how they affect each other and change over the course of the film. Paul Giamatti, Dominic Sessa, and Dave and Joy Randolph are all fantastic here, playing characters that are all lonely and damaged and hurt in slightly different ways. Even with its sarcastic humor, The Holdovers is definitely a melancholic film, but one that's still strangely comforting and cozy. Despite telling a very emotional story, it never gets manipulative or overly sentimental. It's just affecting. So that means my number one movie of 2023 is Past Lives. This romantic drama directorial debut by Celine Song is an easy top film of the year for me. For a movie about fate, it's funny that I almost didn't get a chance to see it. This was a late add to the program at Sundance last year, and none of the few screenings that were added fit into my schedule. So despite the extremely positive word of mouth, I had resigned myself to the disappointment of not being able to see it. But then an early morning screening got added on one of my last days there, and I got there extra early to make sure I could get in. From a plot perspective, this is a deceptively simple story. It's a relationship drama that plays out over 24 years, a story of longing, reminiscing, and the persistent question of what if. Past Lives is a film about connection, focusing on the concept of inion, which is specifically a fate-based connection between people. And let me tell you, I connected with this movie. Many people will be able to see parallels to their own lives and experiences in this movie, but wow did this hit me so much harder than I ever expected it to. With its melancholic cycle of loss, yearning, and reconnection, this felt achingly personal, right down to the scarily coincidental 12-year time gaps. 
Right from that first viewing last January, I knew this was going to be the emotionally resonant film to beat, and no other film managed it in the 11 months that followed. Alright, so there you have it. Those were my top movies of 2023. I have a feeling that this list probably looks a bit different from most people's, but that just goes to show the variety of great films 2023 had to offer. I've already reviewed most of these movies, so be sure to check those out if you want some more in-depth discussion of each, as well as my ratings, pros and cons, and even tailored film recommendations. And if you're interested in buying any of these 2023 movies, I do have affiliate links to most of them in the description below. I do get a small commission from anything you buy in one of my links, so I'd really appreciate it if you'd use them if you're in the market for any of these movies. And I'd also love to hear what your top 10 movies of 2023 were, so be sure to let me know in the comments below. Alright, so if you got some enjoyment, insight, or information out of this top list, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please hit subscribe or add it to see more videos like this, as well as movie reviews. Till next time, this has been Alyssa with Mainly Movies. The way life should be.